Hello and welcome, students, to our first uh, experience into the realm of screencasting. Uh, shout out to period four. Sorry I couldn't be there today. Here's my uh, recitation of today's lesson via the digital era. So what we're learning about today is the wonderful world of mirrors. Uh, crazy devices uh, that are very simple, just a very shiny surface, as we've discussed in class before, which can be put to incredible use. Uh, as you can see in this photo, this girl is in a room uh, entirely composed of mirrors, and the result is quite astonishing. We'll be looking at kind of simpler examples, but after we've become experts at this kind of stuff, we can start to ask questions about how this stuff works. So, first thing we'll look at is the different types of mirrors that are out there, at least the three most common types. Uh, the first and most common type is known as a plain mirror, and it's one that you're very familiar with. It's the kind that's in your bathroom at home. Uh, a plain mirror is called such, not because it's shaped like an airplane, but because it's shaped like a plane, as in a uh, flat, two-dimensional surface. Uh, so this is the type we're most familiar with. You can see the photo of this guy right here looking into the plain mirror, and he looks just the same way that he does in real life. There's no distortion, he's not any bigger or smaller than usual. Plane mirrors are pretty straightforward. Angle in equals angle out. We've learned that law of reflection. Plane mirrors obey it pretty well. The other type of mirror we can study, and there's actually examples of this in the real world around you right now if you're in Mr. Cowell's classroom, that's me, uh, is a convex mirror. Convex is a fancy word that means bulged or spherical shaped, uh, and the reflective portion of the mirror in this case is on the outside of the mirror. Now the result of this is that fisheye lens effect that you see in some like skateboarding videos and um, athletic events where people have helmet cams on and they're trying to get a wide field of view. So convex mirrors are very common. They're used as uh, the purpose you can see right here is it's a convenience store of some kind uh, and the uh, spherical shape of the mirror helps you to see different angles that are in the store. So if someone's trying to shoplift a little bar of soap there, uh, trying to grease their pits, uh, then you'll see this person from anywhere in the store. It gives a wide range of views. The third type that we're going to study is called a concave mirror. Concave mirrors are pretty funky. In fact, you can see what's going on right here. Uh, these people are cooking their food. Uh, these hippies here are cooking some kind of vegan dish, I'm sure, uh, with a concave mirror. And this is fascinating, the fact that you can do something like this with a mirror. The light which is coming down from the sun, and this is the visible light, not the radio, x-ray, infrared, none of that. The visible light is being gathered by the concave mirror that you're seeing in this picture, and all of the light is being focused into a focus point, we'll call it. And the focus point is just this kind of imaginary location in front of the mirror, there's nothing there, but all of the light that comes in collimated or parallel from the sun will reach that one focus point because of the shape, the curvature, the inward reflection of the concave mirror. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with that. You can, uh, well, we'll see. I don't want to spoil anything. So what can we do with these mirrors? Uh, well, one thing that you can do with a mirror is just take some light and shine the light on the mirror and, hey, see what happens. This is the simplest possible thing you can ask for. What does a mirror do? So what we'll do in this first example is we'll draw our picture of a mirror uh, which you can see in the diagram below. And the reason you can tell it's a mirror is because it's kind of got that diagonal hashing uh, inside of the diagram. Whenever you see a picture of a mirror, it'll always be some kind of surface and it'll have that diagonal line pattern and that'll show you that you're looking at a mirror as opposed to a lens, like what glasses are made out of that you can pass light through. This is a mirror and so light's gonna bounce right off of it. Now here's what I'll do with this mirror. I'm gonna put a mirror uh, in front of a few beams of light. So those beams of light head toward the mirror. There happen to be five in this diagram, but there could be one, there could be three, but five's a good number. Uh, it's the amount you have on your hand, so that's pretty easy to keep track of. And those five beams of light will strike the mirror, and then after they do so, they'll do something. As we move forward in time, as we're doing right now as we watch this video, that beam of light will, at the speed of light, move away from the mirror. And so it moved in towards the mirror, then it's going to bounce right back. And there's a very predictable direction that beam of light will take. It'll just bounce straight back. And that's because the angle that it strikes the mirror at is zero degrees. And again, as we've talked about before, angle in equals angle out. So if the angle in is zero, the angle out will be zero. So it struck the mirror head on, totally perpendicular. That means it's going to head off, totally perpendicular. So anyways, this is for a plane mirror, and 
It's kind of appropriate that it's called a plane mirror because it's pretty plain, the thing that happens here. The light comes in, comes out, no fuss. What we can look at that's much more fascinating, though, is the different types of mirrors that are not plain, the convex and the concave. That's what we'll look at now. So let's reflect some collimated light on a convex mirror. Let's start there. So in a convex mirror, again, you see the hatching here showing that this is a mirror we're looking at. It's a reflective surface that light will bounce off of. And again, convex means it's a bulge. So the bulging shape means that it's a convex mirror. Uh, so the beams of light will come in. They'll strike the mirror. And when they strike the mirror, just like with the plain mirror we saw a second ago, these beams of light will also fly off the mirror. That's what mirrors do. They reflect light back out. But not each of these five beams of light are going to do the same thing. Some of them are going to be a little bit different. So here's what I mean. Let's look at just the middle one first. The middle beam of light is striking the mirror head on, dead center, pretty much. When it hits dead center, that angle that it hits the mirror at is about zero. You know, if you were looking at just that one little spot in the center of the bulge there, you'd kind of think you were at an angle of zero. And so that first ray of light is going to bounce off at zero degrees because the incident angle was zero. The first angle it came in with was zero, so it leaves at zero. Now the others have a different story. Let's look at the two beams that are outside the middle. Those two are going to strike at a bit of an angle. So if the bulge is like this and the beam of light comes in like this, well, if you kind of straighten that out in your mind, if you kind of tilt your head and see that as a flat angle where it's striking, then there is an angle in, and so there will be an angle out. So these two beams that are not in the center, those are actually going to be cast out at a new angle, at least from our perspective. And the outer two will be even more dramatic because they hit at an even greater angle. So a convex mirror, when collimated light, when parallel beams strike a convex mirror, the light is what we would say is diverged. The beams have been diverged from each other, and that means things are spreading apart. So another way you could say that is the light is divergent, like the book series, but better because it's physics. So that was a convex mirror. Let's see what happens when we have a concave mirror. So here's a concave mirror. Uh, again, the hatching shows that this is a mirror, and concave just means it's kind of a bowl shape. The way I always remember the difference between convex and concave, something you might mess up, is that concave is the one that's shaped like a little itty bitty cave that you could crawl into. So a little bear cub could be sitting inside our concave mirror again, because it's a cave, you can go inside of it. Convex, I don't know, it's the one that's not concave. I don't have a trick for that one. So concave mirror, same situation as before. We'll have our beams of light head into the mirror. And just like last time, if we look at the first middle beam first, that one is striking at about an angle of zero degrees. So that one's gonna bounce right back the way it came. The other ones are a different story. The ones that are just outside the center, the second and fourth beams of light, let's say, those ones are gonna hit at an angle, just like they did in the convex mirror, but this time, they're not gonna bounce out, they're both going to bounce in. Because again, the angles are different than they were in the last example. They're actually, you know, because the mirror shape is bending in, it's different angles we're hitting at. Now, we can get into exactly why these exact angles come in, but we'll skip that extra discussion for now. We'll just say, this is how it is, believe me. Uh, those angles will all kind of hit this same point, and it's kind of fascinating. No matter where that parallel beam of light hits the mirror, every single beam will always hit this same exact point in space, this imaginary point that we call the focal point. Now, it's just some itty-bitty location in space, and all the parallel beams that strike the mirror, no matter where they strike, will all end up meeting up at the focal point. So there's our focal point right there in green, labeled with an F, uh, and that's something that'll be pretty important later. So let's just kind of stash that in our brains for later on, that there is this thing called a focal point, and light, when it strikes a concave mirror, always goes to that focal point, assuming the beams of light coming in are parallel with each other. So we have our focal point, and uh, we still have two beams left to account for. Again, both of those will hit at more dramatic angles than the kind of more inner ones, and those ones will also happen to go towards the focal point. Again, interesting, uh, we'll note that for later, that everything that comes in parallel to a concave mirror ends up converging at the focal point. That's actually the key word there, convergence. The light that goes into a concave mirror, assuming that it's all parallel, we would call convergent. We would say the light converges in a concave mirror, or at least collimated light, parallel light, converges in a concave mirror. Phew, so there's a lot of stuff on mirrors, but we're not done. Because when you look at yourself in a mirror, what you're not, you're not seeing 
parallel beams of light, you're seeing an object, an image. And the way an object is formed, or the way an image is formed from an object, I should say, is a little more fascinating than this. And it's, a, it's not more complicated, but it is different than this. So this is what will happen right in front of you if you shine a flashlight at one of these mirrors. But how often do you do that? Probably never, unless you're crazy. So what we'll actually do is we'll try to look at now what does it mean, what's happening when you look at yourself in a mirror, or when you look at any object in a mirror. So to talk about that, we'll have to talk about how to form an image with a mirror. So let's get to it. Okay, so here's part two, uh, hopefully with 60% less me being in the way of things on the screen. Sorry about that. Never stop trying new things. So, forming an image with a mirror, what the heck is this going to be about? Well, uh, what we just discussed is what happens when perfectly parallel beams of light come and strike a mirror. What's going to happen to those beams of light? To be totally honest, that's not the most useful thing that we do with a mirror. Uh, what's much more useful is asking the question, well, what is a reflection? When you look at yourself in the mirror in the bathroom, uh, when you're getting the stuff out of your eyes in the morning, you're saying, oh God, I don't want to go to school today. Uh, what is that thing you're seeing in the mirror? It's, it's you, but you know it's not really you. I mean, we're not animals. We know that when we look at our, uh, our reflection, it's not really us. We are animals. Sorry, bio teachers. Um, so what is that that you're seeing? Well, it's definitely not you. What we would say is that your reflection is an image of you. It's something you can see, but it's not real. So what is the image? How is it formed? That's what we're going to look at now, and that's much more useful than what we just covered, which is fascinating, but it's not the most intense thing you can do with a mirror. So here's a surface, and you could imagine this is the ground, or it doesn't have to be the ground, but let's make it simple. In the first example, we'll say, there's a line. It represents the ground. Let's put an object on the ground. Let's use a tree, for example. Uh, we could use a person, a giraffe, a zebra, my mom, uh, but let's use a tree just because that's easy. We all know what a tree looks like. Uh, a tree is an object, and if you put that tree in front of a mirror, you would see a reflection of that tree. But what is the reflection? Again, how is it formed? So here is a mirror. We'll add this mirror into our diagram. Again, the hatched lines show you that it's a mirror, not a lens or anything, and that'll be important to distinct later on. Uh, so the tree is in front of a mirror. Where will we see the reflection of the tree? How far back into the mirror world will it seem to exist? That's the question we'll try and answer now. And there's a couple rules that we're gonna have to go through, a couple steps that will show us exactly where the reflection will be, what it will look like, will it be distorted, will it look perfect? We'll see. First, we have to go through step one. Step one is gonna ask you to draw something. So here's step one. Number one, draw a ray of light that leaves the top of the object and is parallel to the principal axis. Principal axis, what is that? Well, that's actually the ground in this case. That's the line that I drew that's perpendicular to the mirror. So it's just something you establish at the beginning of the problem. You establish where the principal axis is, you draw your mirror perpendicular to the principal axis, and you go from there. So, okay, let's draw a ray of light that leaves the top of the object, so it's gotta hit the top of the tree, and it has to be parallel to that line that we drew in black. So that ray would look like this. Here's a line that's leaving the top of the tree, okay? and it is parallel to the principal axis. Okay, cool, so we've got a red line coming off a tree. Doesn't mean much by itself. Let's go to step two, let's see what step two says. Step two says draw a ray of light that still leaves the top of the object, just like the first thing we drew, but now that ray of light has to hit the mirror at the principal axis. And again, we just said the principal axis is this black line that we established in the middle. Uh, so. Well, let's draw the same ray, but it's going to be angled down a little bit. It's got to look like this. This is a ray of light that leaves the top of the object and hits the mirror at the principal axis. Okay, now we've got two rays of light coming off of the top of a tree and hitting a mirror. What does it mean? Well, be patient, okay? Stay with me. We're going to get somewhere with this. Let's move on to step three. Step three says, follow the rays of light forward in time until they meet up again an image of the object will be formed, and that's the reflection, an image of the object will be formed wherever the two rays meet up again. Now, why is it important that they meet up again? Well, notice that these two rays of light used to be in the same location. It's the same top of the tree that we're looking for here, but the top of the tree had light bouncing off it from all directions, from the sun, maybe from a flashlight or from a match, uh, or maybe light that bounced from the sun off the ground back to the tree, but there's definitely going to be more than one beam of light coming off an object at any one given time. So these two rays, they used to be in the same location, now they're spreading out. If they ever meet back up, 
we'll actually see an image of the tree in that location. So let's go forward in time, let's see where these rays will end up, and let's see where they meet back up. Now I'll look at the top ray of light first. I'm noticing it's going from the tree straight into the mirror at an angle of zero. So okay, we've seen this before. An angle of zero in corresponds to an angle of zero out. So I know where that ray of light's gonna go. It's gonna go right back where it came from. So let's follow that. That ray of light will go right back where it came from, straight over the top of the tree, and okay, end of story for that guy. Uh, so how about the lower one? Well, the lower one is being angled down, and that one is striking the mirror at an angle. Angle in equals angle out. So that thing is gonna head off with the same angle it came in with. So that will look like this, and at this point, we have to kind of forget the fact that I was calling the principal axis the ground. Realistically, we have to imagine that light can travel through the ground in this example. So forgive me for that uh, analogy if it doesn't quite work for you. Deal with it. Okay, so we have our two rays of light. We seem to have followed step three. We followed the rays forward in time until they met up again. And uh, actually, no, they didn't meet up again. In fact, they're now diverging. They're actually spreading further apart which implies they'll never reach each other. They won't ever meet up. So these two rays of light are forever alone. Poor little guys. Um, okay, so what does this mean? Well, it looks like we can't move forward. We're not gonna form an image unless those two rays can meet back up. But there's a hidden rule number four. Ooh, aren't you lucky? I'm gonna give you one more rule. This is something that we're gonna do if the rays of light never seem to meet back up again. If it looks like they'll never meet because they're diverging, here's what you do. Step four says, if the rays never meet, Follow them behind the mirror. What this will do is replicate how our eyes try to find the origin of where these rays came from. Here's what I mean by that. Your brain is limited in its ability to comprehend the universe. There's only so much we can gather with our five senses, five-ish, depending on who you ask. So our eyes kind of work like this. Here's an eye popping into the diagram, and that eye is looking at those two diverging rays of light and this is just like your eye, this is what your eye does when you look at a mirror. You see these two diverging rays of light, and your eye thinks, man, there's two diverging rays of light, and if I follow them back in time, they seem to be kind of coming from the same location. You see what I'm saying? They're diverging, they're moving further apart, so if I went back in time, they must have come from the same location. You follow me? No? Okay, good. So let's see what that would look like. Let's follow these rays back in time as your eye would see it. Your eye would see this. Aha, these diverging rays came from about the same location. And of course, we know that this is nothing behind a mirror. Stupid brain, you're interpreting this wrong. But that's just what our brain does to fill in the gaps, to try and understand how a mirror works. So your brain will say, aha, these diverging rays of light must have came from this location where the two rays meet back up. And in fact, our brain will interpret whatever it can comprehend, and our brain will think, yes, there is a tree behind that mirror. That's just how your brain will work. It'll think that the mirror is just a window, and you're looking outside of the window into a land where there's a tree. That's just the way your brain will interpret it. Stupid brain, but that's how it works. So you can see from the diagram that the tree is in front of the mirror by a certain distance, and the tree is also behind the mirror at a certain distance. So if you ever stand in front of a mirror and you're like two feet away, let's say, or a meter, let's be metric here, uh, if you're one meter in front of a mirror, then your reflection will appear to be an additional meter in the mirror world. So you can kind of see that distance uh, ratio working out pretty well with these trees right here. That's kind of how it works when you're tracing these rays. So okay, now we figured out how to form an image with a mirror. The trick was drawing those two special rays and then following them forward in time and finding where they met up. And in this case, they didn't meet up. So we said, oh, okay, well, how will the brain interpret this? Brain will say, aha, these two diverging rays of light must have come from the same location, even though they didn't technically. Uh, and they meet back up behind the mirror in the mirror world. And so we see this virtual image that isn't really there. You know, you could look behind the mirror and see it's just false. It's not actually existent. But when you look into the mirror, this is what you see, because your brain is trying to make sense of what a mirror actually is. Again, stupid brain. Now, this is the hardest part right here. Just knowing these two rays of light to draw off of an object and doing this over and over again will make it much, much easier. So anyways, this is with a plane mirror, but there's a couple complexities to objects and images that they form. So we have to make a couple distinctions. First of all, an image that's formed by a mirror can either be erect, which means standing straight up, or it can be inverted, which means upside down. 
So an upside down image, we would call that inverted. That's the official sciency word for it. And the official sciency word for standing straight up is erect. And if you giggle, I will be upset. So an image can be either erect or inverted, or there's another little difference that we'll have to specify. Uh, images that are cast from objects can either be virtual, meaning they're not real, or real, meaning they are real. Kind of hard to piece those apart, isn't it? Uh, first of all, virtual. We'll look at that first. A virtual image is something that isn't really there, but it looks like it's there. So how would we specify exactly what makes a virtual image virtual? Well, there's two examples in the pictures right here, one of which is this little lonely little puppy that's looking into a mirror. Oh, it's so cute. And one of which is the sunglasses, where you can see there's a building uh, that you can see in the sunglasses, but of course, you know, there isn't really a building in this person's face. Uh, it's just a reflection. So this would be a virtual image. In fact, both of these are examples of virtual images for two main reasons. Number one, these images are only visible from one perspective, meaning you looking into the sunglasses uh, on the right here, uh, you're the only one that can see that building. If someone were to move to a different region of space and look into the sunglasses, they would see something else. So what you're seeing is only visible to you from your one perspective. Same thing for the puppy. The puppy can see its reflection uh, dead on. You're seeing the side of the puppy's face, so it looks different depending on your perspective. And the second point is, these images both exist only in the mirror world, meaning that if you look behind the sunglasses, uh, you'll see just the person's eye, not a building. And if you look behind the mirror, the puppy's not gonna see its reflection anymore. It'll see whatever's behind the mirror. So neither of these images really exist. They don't actually take up real space. They're in this mirror world, you could say. They're virtual. So that's a virtual image. What's a real image then? And what, what's more real than what we're seeing here? Well, here's an example of a real image, uh, which I'm, I guess is a bit ironic to call it real because this is from a science fiction movie uh, known as Star Trek. Uh, now, in this movie, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is showing Luke Skywalker and C-3PO here a message from Princess Leia, and Princess Leia is being cast in a holographic projection. And a projector is a perfectly good example of something that casts a real image. Now, Princess Leia in this example is uh, visible from all directions. So C-3PO can see her, Luke can see her, Obi-Wan can see her, and they're all seeing the same projection. So this exists in real space. So one way we could kind of differentiate this from a virtual image, again, ironic because it's from a movie, uh, but this real image is called real because number one, it's visible from several perspectives, and number two, more importantly, it exists within real space. So Luke could take his hand and kind of wave it through that hologram, and he'd be putting his hand inside of real light. So it's visible from any direction, it's really in the room, it's not in this like mirror world that's virtual, and that's the main difference. Uh, now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, what's an example of a real, real image, Mr. Cowell? Because this is a movie, so what's a real-life example that isn't from science fiction? Well, okay, if you don't want an example of a hologram, how about another hologram? Let's look at a hologram that was made in real life. This is a hologram of the artist formerly known as Tupac at one of his concerts. Uh, and this is actually one of Tupac's concerts after he passed away. Uh, because people were able to put together a... A recording of someone who looked a lot like Tupac. They recorded him from many different angles and they projected the light from the recordings into one spot and they kind of focused all the recordings together and so you get this very lifelike realistic image of an artist and I believe this was just kind of a look like. Uh, I can't pretend to fully understand how this works. It's a bit complicated, much more complicated than what we're going to get into, but holograms are real and they're possible. Uh, they can be done and they have been done several times. Tupac was just kind of the most famous example in modern history. Uh, so holograms are real, and because you could go into this hologram and wave your arms around and move through Tupac, uh, this is a real image. It's in real space. So that's the difference between a virtual image and a real image, and that'll be important for us later on. Now, forming an image with a plane mirror is something that we just covered. Again, we have the tree on one side, the real object, and we have the image on the other side. Uh, they're equidistant from the mirror. One is real, one's kind of in the mirror world, and that's what you can tell from the dotted lines. That means we're in mirror land. Um, and at this point we have to ask, okay, is this image that was formed real or is it virtual? And another question we have to ask is, is the image erect or is it inverted? Shouldn't be that hard to kind of piece apart. Uh, is it real or is it virtual? Well, you're always going to decide that based on one thing. Is it in real space or is it in the mirror world, in virtual space? And in this case, it looks like the image is behind the mirror. It's beyond the breadth of the mirror. So that means it is virtual. And is the image erect or inverted? Well, 
it looks like it's going to be right side up. And in fact, anytime you use a plane mirror and you look at yourself in the mirror, you're not upside down, you're right side up, unlike the image we saw in the spoon earlier on. So this is an image that is, number one, virtual, because it's in virtual space, and number two, it's erect because it's standing straight up. So this is something we already analyzed. Now we're just asking the question, is it real or is it virtual? And we're asking, is it erect or is it inverted? We'll always have to specify those two things in the future. So that's with a plane mirror. Now that we know all the kind of basic rules, let's just look at the next two mirrors and then we'll call it a day. So a convex mirror, let's form an image with a convex mirror, meaning when you look into a convex mirror, what do you see? Well, here's our principal axis, as we've shown before. Uh, here's our object that we're gonna lay on the principal axis, and here's that convex mirror. We'll do the same two rays of light that we did for the plane mirror. This time we'll just be making the rays hit a convex mirror instead of a flat one. So here's the first ray of light. It's coming in from the top of the object and striking the mirror and it's parallel with the principal axis. So it's parallel. Second ray of light, according to rule number two says, draw the same thing, but this time it has to be angled down so that it hits the principal axis and the mirror at the same time. Okay, so now we'll obey rule number three. We'll follow these guys forward in the future and we'll see what happens. Now, one of these is very predictable. The ray of light that's striking the center of the mirror is going to bounce off with the same angle that it bounced in with. So that means that ray in the future will move away from the mirror in the angle you're seeing now. The ray up top, even though in the plane mirror example, it went back the way it came, in this case, it's hitting a convex mirror. So it's hitting at an angle. That means that one's going to escape up. So, okay, now we're going to the future and we're saying, all right, these two are gonna diverge. They'll eventually move away from each other. This is another example where we're gonna have to go to the hidden rule four, which says, if these two rays of light move away and they never come back together, then no image will be formed. Unless you say, what would the human eye think? Okay, so the human eye is now in this diagram. Again, this is you and your brain looking at a convex mirror and you're seeing these two diverging rays of light. And your brain thinks, aha, uh -huh, these two rays of light are diverging. They're moving away from each other. So if I went back in time, eventually they would be in the same location sometime. And that's what your brain will do. So if we follow those rays of light back in time, as you're seeing here, there is technically a virtual location where those two rays of light came from, let's say, in huge quotation marks. Uh, so your brain sees the diverging rays coming from the same location, therefore that's where the object will be, and now we notice there's a difference between the object and the image. It's much smaller. That's the main difference. So if you wanted to look around at a convex mirror near you, and if you're in my classroom, there's at least two, you'll notice that everything looks a little bit smaller than normal. Or if you've ever had a mirror that was on a car window that was convex, or if you have a little one for camping to kind of see your face when you can't comb your hair in front of the bathroom mirror. Uh, convex mirrors all make things smaller. Now here's a visualization of that. This is a car mirror uh, on a truck. The big portion of the mirror, the flat portion, is just a normal plain mirror, but the really small circular one, that's a convex mirror, and you'll notice you can see a wider range, you have a wider field of view. Uh, so things might appear smaller, but that means you can fit more things into the image. So here's what happens when you form an image with a convex mirror. Here's to summarize. Number one, it's always going to reduce the size of the images. So we had an object that was yay big. Now we have an image that's yay big. It's a little bit smaller. So that's number one. Number two, a convex mirror is going to allow you a wider field of view. So that's why people use the fisheye lenses on their uh, GoPros and cameras that they use for athletic events because you can see more things even though it looks a little distorted. So that's for a convex mirror. Now the last thing we're going to look at is a concave mirror. What does an image look like in a concave mirror? And this one's a little bit complicated, so bear with me. Or don't. Or just fall asleep. Whatever, I don't care. Uh, here's an object. And just like before, we're going to do the same two rays of light coming off this object, but this time they're going to strike a concave mirror. So our first ray of light is gonna come from the top of the object, it's gonna go across, and it's going to hit the mirror parallel to the principal axis. So that was ray number one. Ray number two, just like before, is gonna not be parallel to the axis, but actually hit the axis at the point where it strikes the mirror. Now we'll move on to rule number three, or step three, which says follow these rays of light forward in time. Now the one that hit the principal axis, that's gonna have an angle in, which means it will have the same angle out. So to trace that line, there you go. We have the ray escaping downward. The one that was up top in our convex example went straight up into the air because of the angle it hit at. This one's gonna do the opposite, it's going to go down. Now just as a reminder from a previous slide we were on, 
when a parallel beam of light comes in and strikes a convex mirror, it's always going to go to the, hmm, hmm, the focal point. Good, glad you knew that. The focal point is where this ray of light is destined to go, and that's guaranteed because it's parallel with the principal axis, so it's definitely going to hit the focal point because this is a concave mirror. So we actually already know where this ray of light is going to go. It'll go through that focal point. you like that sound effect? So now we have these two rays of light, and hey, interesting, these two are actually converging in real space. This is the first example we've seen of this. Awesome. Right on. So the object is going to have its two rays meet up again at some point. That's where the image will be formed. And look at this. The image is actually upside down. It's inverted, we could call it. Okay, interesting. Now, it just so happens in this one example, the image is equidistant from the mirror as the object was. They're the same distance from the mirror. Uh, that's not always going to be the case with a concave mirror. That's just in this one example I gave. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of variation that you can have with concave mirrors depending on where you are in relation to the focal point. Uh, so here's just one example of the type that we've seen just now. There's different things you can do with a concave mirror, but here's an example of a candle. The candle in this case is the object. It's the thing that is... Uh, projecting light onto the mirror. Now the mirror is in the foreground of this image, so you can't really see the reflective side, but we're seeing the back of the mirror. And then in the distance, you see a piece of paper that has a weird shape on it. That is the flame of the candle inverted, upside down. And if you look close, you can see that it's a flame from a candle inverted. You know, the top is kind of where the match head is, the bottom is the tip of the flame. So it's just an upside down candle. So this image is an exact copy, essentially, of what we've got in our diagram. Now, again, like I was saying, a concave mirror doesn't always end up this way. It's kind of the most complicated example because if you move the object inside the focal point, you actually get something different. So here's an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a girl and a boy who are next to a giant concave mirror, and the boy is standing kind of like where the tree is in the diagram. He's standing beyond the focal point, whereas the girl is very close to the mirror, and she's within the focal range of the mirror. She's you know, ahead of the focal point. Now she sees a erect image that is enlarged, whereas he's seeing an inverted image that is inverted. Took me a second, total blank. Uh, okay, so we have these two different images, both can be formed by a concave mirror. We'll play with this a little bit in class and we'll see examples of this and we will go through examples where, you know, what exactly makes an upright image? What exactly makes an inverted image? We'll get to that. But just so you know, there are different possibilities with a concave mirror. It's pretty funky. So here's to summarize concave mirrors. Uh, the two points that are important. Number one, a concave mirror can either increase or decrease the size of an image. It can actually do either. So that makes it kind of hard to categorize, but it's also the most interesting and most useful type of mirror. Number two, concave mirrors can produce either erect images or inverted images, as you're seeing in this photograph. It depends on where you're standing. So this third and final point is concave mirror is a little bit temperamental. It depends on where the object is relative to the focal point. So uh, that's where I'll end it today. Thank you for bearing with me through this ex uh, experience where I messed up a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but hey, lifelong learners, that's what we should all be. So thank you very much, and we will talk more on this later on. Thanks a lot.